tonight uh, I have uh, a guest who I'm super excited about. Um, one of the things I like most about her uh, is her passion for the technical aspects of landscape architecture, uh, and particularly in grading and drainage. So many of you will suffer through the grading and drainage course, uh, but, but grading and drainage, or really uh, manipulation of the surface of the land, is, is really fundamental to what we do. Um, I think you'll enjoy hearing from a landscape architect who connects deeply with the expression of the landform as an art and a technical process. So our guest tonight studied sculpture, topography, and European art history at Wellesley College. She holds an MLA from University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, her curiosity has led her to work at many different types of firms, um, including her own private practice during the uh, 2000s. Um, she's an expert in permitting and construction drawings and highly skilled in analysis and communication between disciplines. Just a few more things. <laughs> yeah. uh, she's a licensed landscape architect in the state of California uh, and is Bay Friendly certified. Uh, she also teaches the preparatory course for the uh, LARE, the Landscape Architects Registration Exam. Uh, she's taught um, graduate and undergraduate grading and drainage classes here at the Academy of Art uh, and wrote the land class, the online land grading and drainage class for us. Um, additionally, she's been a lecturer at the Merritt College Department of Horticulture and UC Berkeley Landscape Architecture Department. Um, she was a senior associate, se senior landscape architect at both April Phillips Design and Thuyo Associates. Uh, she's currently an associate principal at PlaceWorks, a planning and design firm in Berkeley where she manages public park and trail projects. Please welcome Sarah Gronquist. Thank you, Jeff. That's, that's a lot of detail, but it's all true. So uh, my name is Sarah Gronquist, and I'm just going to tell you a minute about where I work at the beginning, and, and we'll come back to this later on in a little bit more detail. But um, at this point in my career, uh, I'm working at a fairly large firm. It's primarily a planning firm with a small landscape architecture division. Uh, PlaceWorks has six offices throughout the state of California, uh, Santa Ana, Los Angeles, uh, smaller sal satellite offices in Folsom and other places. Uh, I work out of the Berkeley office, which is over on Shattuck Avenue, and it's a very lovely group of people and a nice group of uh, professionals to work with. There's about 30 of us there, and out of that group of 30, eight of us are landscape architects. And I'm one of the principals. There's two principals that oversee the landscape architecture work. So that's my current role. Uh, PlaceWorks does some interesting work that landscape architects don't always get a look at. So on the planning side, um, if you are going to sit for your licensing exam and you want to take the California special exam section, you will need to know about CEQA and about how planning works in California. Uh, I get to see it every day at work. Uh, we do general plans. We write uh, CEQA uh, opinions and statements. Uh, we do um, greenhouse gases plans. That's what GHG is for. A lot of cities in the Bay Area right now are really interested in writing sustainability sections into their general plans. And they want to do things like reduce car trips, uh, encourage bicycle commuting, all kinds of things that we love, right? Landscape architects, we get to do the bicycle lanes and the sidewalks and all of the pieces that go along with those plans. Um, the landscape design portion of PlaceWorks does mostly public projects. So that's uh, hiking trails. Uh, my first week at PlaceWorks, I went out and spent an hour hacking through the redwoods down in La Honda because we are doing a new hiking trail and we were hiking the route before anything had been developed. So we were just pushing branches out of the way. So that's really fun work. And um, complete streets projects. So that would be taking an old conventional street and turning it into a bike lane and a sidewalk and tree medians uh, and having maybe less road for cars to travel on, but more multimodal transit. Uh, and then we also do a lot of parks and playgrounds. So I'll show you some of those projects later on. Um, but I just wanted to let you know where I am now. 
as a starting point. I'm going to back up a little bit because I've taken maybe a non-traditional path to get here. <laughs> um, and I don't know, for some of you, maybe it will encourage you if you feel like you're not getting in as linear, fast a direction as you wish you were. Uh, I grew up in a very rural part of western New York State. This is an aerial of uh, my neighborhood. So you can see, uh, gosh, I almost know, I think my house was like here. <laughs> These are all um, farm lots. Lots tend to be about 80 acres in size. So the houses are very far apart. Um, there are no sidewalks. Uh, this is a street that I grew up on. And it's straight as an arrow because it's literally made along the line between two townships in this rural part of the country. So um, some of my friends really loved living out in the country. And I was like, get me out of here. So as soon as I graduated from high school, uh, I went off to college, and I feel very fortunate still that I was able to go to Wellesley and um, enter really a whole new world of more urban environments. Uh, I got to travel. I got to get, learn my way around Boston. I got to go to Italy. I got to go to Australia. Um, and I also got an amazing education there. Um, I picked Wellesley because they had a bronze casting foundry. And it was all women. And I wanted to pour molten metal with some women. So that was how I ended up there in a nutshell. And while I was there, um, I did get to do quite a bit of sculptural work. This is a little piece that I still have. It's, it's about this big, maybe. It's been portable and easy to carry around. Um, but that was really where I started. And I, uh, I loved that world of shapes. And I think, you know, I put this presentation together and then I was looking at it today and this, this idea that things have form, not just objects, but the landscape has form too. You could think of a sculptural piece like this as being a positive object or you could think of a bowl that it rests in as being a negative space that it occupies. And so this interest translated very directly to landscape architecture for me. And you know, I continue to be really excited about grading and drainage because it's not all calculations. It's about making shapes with the earth, which is really inexpensive and great to do. And it's permanent. It lasts a long time. So I'll show you some of the landscapes that are continuing to inspire me later on. But, but this was the starting point. For a while, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I spent quite a bit of time knocking around, doing funny things that wouldn't turn out to be my ultimate path. But in a weird way, they turned out to be very useful later on. So uh, after college, I moved out to Oakland. And I worked uh, doing picture framing and some gallery work, um, desktop publishing. Back when that was still a profession that existed, we had a firm, we had a company with big Heidelberg presses as big as a car, and we would print books mostly with those presses. And uh, I was a paste up girl, which was maybe my favorite job ever, although I don't think you can make a living at it. And you may not even know what paste up is, but you would take your text and run it through a wax machine, and it would put sticky wax on one side, and then you'd take an X Acto knife and cut out all those little pieces of text and stick them on a bigger piece of paper and then take a picture of that. And then that was used to make the type presses. I, I don't know. This doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> but um, you know, it was visual. It was about telling a story. Uh, I always liked work that required using your hands, too. I think that's another common thread. So I did that for a few years, and then I was like, eh, I don't think I want to be doing this when I'm 50. Uh, so I decided to explore garden design. And um, I don't know, I just got the phone book out, and I started calling people. I said, hey, you know, I'm smart. I can draw. Um, can you use me? And I actually found a bunch of firms, small firms, that were willing to hire me part-time and let me do stuff. 
And uh, I worked for many years for Chris Hecht, who was a private residential design build company in the Oakland Hills. They're famous for their masonry work. And I'll show you some of that in a minute. Um, he just needed someone to make drawings so that he could get building permits. And his guys knew how to build everything. We would just make a few drawings showing where everything was going to go on the site. And then we didn't even really need to detail it because the crew knew, oh, we're doing this kind of wall just like we always do. And then they would go build it. It was a great learning experience for me because I drew it. And then maybe a month later, it got built. And they would call me and they'd say, oh, you didn't calculate the right number of steps. And we had to redesign the stairs when we got out there. And I learned a lot. But they were also very supportive, nice people to work with. Um, and then I did hand drafting in the office of David Thorne. And he's actually become a fairly well-known, very high-end private residential garden designer in Oakland now. Uh, when I knew him, it was just the two of us, and we were stomping around in people's backyards with a tape measure because the projects couldn't afford a surveyor. But this was like 1989, 1990. I'm, I'm dating myself, but it was a while ago. Um, I worked for Laura Duhom, who had a, a design-build company. Um, I worked on an installation crew uh, for California Gardens. And so I was out there every day putting pipes together and planting things and placing rocks. And um, all of that was really great experience. Even though it felt like I didn't know what I was doing at the time, all of it's been really great experience. So um, here's an example of the kind of drawings that I was doing then. You can see this is pretty simple, uh, what's happening in this drawing. And it's a grading plan, even though it looks really, really simple. There's a house at the bottom of the hill. And they had this big sloping backyard that they wanted access to. And so what we ended up doing was making a stairway with a ramp with stairs and then making this really beautiful masonry patio almost all the way at the top of the hill. And again, I would go out with a, a little hand level, which is something that you guys might still have to do in the online course because I think I wrote it into the grading and drainage class. They're great. You can do a lot with just a little handheld level. And you know, I would liter literally figure out the elevation change from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill and try and figure out how many treads, because then that has horizontal implications. All right, so you need to know the vertical change and the horizontal change to lay these gardens out. But on this one, there was a lot of margin for error. And I knew if I didn't get it quite right, the guys would fix it in the field. And then um, this is what that ended up looking like when it was done. Uh, we hadn't planted yet. You can see the plants are still sitting around in cans. Um, but this is that patio with a masonry retaining wall in fill at the bottom and another masonry wall in cut at the top. So we balanced out our cut and fill, just like we always encourage you to do. Um, and his crew did beautiful work of this type. This is uh, hand-laid Napa basalt, tightly fitted with mortar behind it. Um, I was proud of a lot of these gardens. And here's what those stairs looked like. These were boxed timbers with simple infill of gravel and flagstone. So, you know, this is like small little companies. The budgets weren't too big. They were uncomplicated. It was just the right speed for me uh, at this point in my career. But then I decided I wanted to do landscape architecture after all, and I was ready to commit. So I went off to UMass Amherst. I was still kind of thinking, do I want to live on the East Coast? Do I want to live on the West Coast? Um, UMass Amherst is an agricultural school. It's a land grant school. You can get a master's in landscape architecture there. But it's sort of more on the pragmatic farming side of things than the high design, maybe Harvard end of things, um, which was great for me because I already had an art degree. And I just wanted to know, how do you do this? What are the practical tools uh, that landscape architects use? And um, while I was there, I got to work on time saver standards, which was really fun. And I did some work with co-housing groups. Another thing that's been kind of a common thread for me is that I've always been sort of interested in the planning side, the environment within which we do things. 
you can't just go out and build a retaining wall. The city's going to review it, and they have rules in, um, in the code that govern what you're allowed to do. And it just seemed like a really fun puzzle to me to put this stuff together. So I got to do some of that at Amherst. <clears throat> With my new MLA, I came back to the Bay Area. And uh, again, you know, this restlessness, I bounced around a lot from firm to firm. And, you know, maybe three years here, three or four years there. Um, the other thing that was happening during this time was um, we were getting closer and closer to the recession at the end of the, the mid-2000s. Um, Patillo and Garrett is an Oakland firm. We did a lot of public projects, uh, larger scale public projects. I really liked working there, but when I started uh, having a family, I didn't understand how I was going to balance having children with having to be at, a, at an office 40 or 50 hours a week. And so I kind of had to get off of the track for a while. And I see that happening with a lot of the women who were my generation. I don't know what it'll be like for younger folks. Um, and, you know, I sort of worried about that at a certain point. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, I worked at a few other firms during that time. Every time you move to a new firm, you learn a ton. You get to see all their standard details. You get to see how they write specs. You understand how they talk to clients. I don't know if I want to recommend that you switch jobs every two to three years, but it is a very fast way to learn a lot about the profession and about how things get done. So when I was at Patillo and Garrett, we got to do some really great public projects. This is um, Fruitvale Transit Village, right by Fruitvale BART. And uh, at that stage in my career, I was a CAD drafter. So I drew all of the construction drawings for this project. And um, it was really a fun one. The whole thing is built on circular geometry. So you can see all these circular planters. They were custom. Um, the retaining walls have parts of circles for their forms. Um, even the paving patterns here were made out of radiuses of circles. Um, and this one was fun, too, because it was right in the middle of the city, and there were so many things that we had to take into account other than the plants and the paving. So we were working with... Um, La Raza, I think. I, I can't remember the name. There was a community organization that was sort of the, the voice of the Fruitvale, and we tried to work as many different um, Latino references into the architecture and the design work as we could because we really wanted to represent the culture of that neighborhood at the gateway to the neighborhood at the BART station. So that was all great fun. Um, and I think that still, I still look at that project from the BART train, and it looks like it's still kicking and pretty successful. Um, during this time period, I also worked on many pieces of the Lake Merritt Master Plan. Um, you guys all know where Lake Merritt is, right? It's sort of the, the centerpiece of Oakland. It's the, everybody's favorite place in Oakland. And... I was a sub-consultant to Wallace, Roberts, and Todd when they were doing the master plan, which was looking at the whole lake at a schematic level. And then that master plan got broken up into a bunch of little specific construction projects. And I worked on those projects at several different firms because I was still kind of jumping around during this time period. But I think the part that was the most fun, um, this is the 12th Street realignment part of the lake. They actually reconfigured all the roads here and created a new um, amphitheater right on the water. Over here, there's a new pedestrian bridge and a new bicycle bridge. Uh, we provided a kayak connection out to the estuary under this bridge with a walking path that went along with that. So I started to kind of get a taste for these bigger projects. So we're not looking at somebody's backyard with a tape measure anymore, right? On this project, it was part of my job. I spent two or three days with a clipboard walking around identifying all the trees that were going to need to be cut down, 400 trees, um, because there was so much grading that needed to be done for the project. Um, so that was fantastic. In 
in 2002, I got my license. And then um, things changed a bit. Um, I had a lucky streak. I was working at Golden Associates, and a friend of mine from my Dave Thorne days had her own practice. And she called me one day and she said, I'm moving to Colorado. Do you want my business? And I said, yeah, I guess I do. And um, this doesn't happen very often. She had projects and clients. Uh, she wanted to leave them in good hands. Um, she didn't want to charge me anything. She just basically said, if you can be responsible and take this over, you can have the business. So I quit my job and I started working out of my garage. And that was when I started my own firm um, which was really just me. I was a sole proprietor at that point. Um, and at, at this time, we're starting to get into the recession a little bit. I mean, it's not this 2002. This is more like a little later on. Um, and being a sole proprietor was good in some ways. I could always be on time to pick up my kids. But it was really hard, too. I was not very good at making money, I will tell you right off the bat. So if you want to have your own firm, you don't have an accountant, and you don't have marketing staff, and you don't have a principal to go out and do all the rainmaking. It's all you. And you can be, as a self-employed person, you can be an employee to a lousy boss, or some days you feel like you're a boss to a lousy employee. It cuts both ways. It's just really hard to wear all those hats and get everything done and still earn the kinds of money that you would working at a larger organization. But again, you know, I, I felt that I learned a lot from it. And um, I probably did this for 10 years. And I was, you know, doing some part-time work for Chris because we were still friends and doing a little part-time work for some of the other firms that I had been at. But most of the time I was winning my own jobs and doing the work by myself on my computer at home sending the drawings out for print at a print shop and getting them back. Um, and just, you know, there's a lot of freedom in that. I used to think about having your own firm as being like having a little boat. And you can sail. <laughs> I'm an analogy person. Um, if you've got your own firm, you can sail that little boat anywhere you want to go. Nobody's going to question your judgment, but you're responsible for doing whatever you're going to do. So under the cover of the firm, I did a lot of different things. I did landscape architecture. I did some more document production, um, public outreach for some projects where I had to make posters and uh, flyers that got mailed out to different people. I wrote a bunch of reports. So all of these sort of liberal arts skills continue to be critically important. You gotta be able to draw, but you gotta be able to write. You have to be able to edit. Um, all of these little pieces, you want to just gather them up and sort of stick them in your pocket because you never know when you're going to need them for a project. So during this time, one of the things that I started to do, uh, because it was fun, but also because I uh, wanted a little bit of steady income, uh, I really started teaching more during the time when I had my own firm because nobody could tell me that I couldn't. I had my own little boat, and I wanted to teach with my little boat. So um, uh, I taught at a lot of different places <laughs> in keeping with this sort of like curiosity and restlessness. Um, my friend Ray Freeman invited me to come and help him teach the licensing review courses. And that was the beginning. That was in 2002. And I did that for a few years and then um, connected with folks at uh, Merritt College and taught planting design and grading and drainage and professional practice up there. And around that time, I came over and talked to Heather. And she said, we need someone to write the grading and drainage course. And I said, I can do that. And um, that was a huge project. But it was also really fun. The thing that's wonderful about teaching is you get to think about all this stuff. You get to step back and have a big picture um, view of it. and in the act of explaining it, you learn it better. And I, I still, in my teaching work, I still learn a ton from my students and from the conversations that we have together. Um, so that's been really, really valuable to me. And I, 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 don't, I don't 
do any of this teaching anymore because being a principal is super time consuming. But I do still do the LARE, uh, which is the ultimate big picture of the profession. It covers all different scales, um, the entire United States, uh, sort of all of the aspects of the profession. So that's continued to be valuable. But here's some of the stuff that I was doing with my firm. I, I just put together a little grab bag of, of things, just a few slides. So this guy called me. Um, he had a corporation yard in South San Francisco where he stored semi-trailers, and that was his business. And the city had come around and said uh, they didn't want to see that eyesore from the street anymore. South San Francisco was getting fancy. So he needed someone to design a screening fence for him that wouldn't be see-through. And, um, you know, I don't know if he cared very much <laughs> what it looked like. He wanted it to be inexpensive. But it was in such an industrial neighborhood. I really enjoyed working on this project. So what we came up with was um, sort of a, a long, a long, long screening wall that was very simple with just different, different widths of... Uh, of steel, corrugated steel. And then every so often to break it up and add some rhythm, we had these slightly larger panels where we flipped those, those uh, steel pieces. And um, we had to do a rolling gate for the vehicles and a pedestrian gate, and it was great, really, really fun. And um, I was so happy when it got planted and finished. Um, we just basically did the minimum that the city required but this was an example of a project where I had a lot of freedom to do something that I thought was interesting while serving the needs of my client. <clears throat> uh, this is a small residential project that I did in Vallejo for a woman uh, for her backyard. And she was another great client. Uh, she also was really interested in exploring some ideas. None of this stuff was expensive. Um, she had an issue with her backyard, and you can see a little bit up here. Uh, right behind her house, there were overhead telephone lines. Really, really visible and obvious, like this eyesore in the backyard. And we were talking about it, and we, we got along great. We had a really good time with this. And I said, well, why don't we detail the garden uh, so that it looks like telephone pole towers? <laughs> and just make a virtue out of that. Um, so we have an arbor here that was basically like a, you can't see it once the plants grow in, but I know it's there. It was a T-shaped arbor with wires holding up the vines. Um, she needed a laundry drying rack, and we came up with this idea of uh, doing it like a milagro. You know, those crosses where you, you hammer in little charms, um, and she could put whatever she wanted on that. And so she really liked that, and she started sticking things on it right away. Uh, she was really excited about doing a green roof on her shed. And this was super low tech. We did not use drainage panels and, you know, fat foam pieces. Uh, we just did some landscape fabric and waterproofing sheets and just gave it a try and saw whether it worked or not. And it looked great and it was really fun. Um, we also got some salvaged pieces, these perforated panels, and used them as accents around the, the back walls of the garden. Uh, so that was fun, too. Um, at a certain point, my kids got old enough so that they didn't need me so much. And we slowly started coming out of the recession. And I started thinking you know, I might really enjoy going back to working in an office and getting to drink my coffee out of a paper cup in the morning and having colleagues. I got very lonely when I was working by myself all the time. And it really started to bother me that I was so solitary. So let's see, probably around 2012, not too long ago, I decided it was time to go back to work and get a formal job. And... Um, I had a different vision about it this time. I wanted to really commit to full-time work, and I wanted to see how fast I could rise within an organization based on my experience. Um, so what I want to tell you is that it's been about five or six years since I decided 
to give up my practice and go back to full-time work. And in that time, I've been very lucky, and I was able to work as a project manager for most of that time. But um, I did uh, end up at PlaceWorks. Now I'm sort of at the top. I'm going to talk about the pyramid in a few minutes. You start out as a drafter, and then you become a project manager. And then once you've exhausted the possibilities there, if you're lucky, you get to go on and become a principal. And what principals do is not um, maybe what we think of so much as traditional landscape architecture. I don't get to do AutoCAD anymore. And I miss AutoCAD, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, but uh, I, I am a really strong believer in trying to figure out what you really want and then just taking every opportunity that seems like it's going to lead you in that direction. And during this time period, I just started saying yes to everything and figuring out how to make it work. And part of what I had to do in order to say yes to everything was accept that everything wasn't going to be perfect. So some of the project management skills that I really rely on now center around aiming for the sweet spot of good enough. Is it good enough to get you on to the next phase? Because if you're chasing perfection all the time, you're not going to be efficient with your fee, and you miss opportunities. Um, and I think when you're a student, you don't have anything except your hard work sometimes. As you go further along in your career, you're going to be able to start saying, well, I know what has to happen for this milestone, and I'm going to make sure that happens, and maybe we'll be able to do some of these extra things, but maybe we won't, and it'll be good enough. Um, and that shift in my perception let me do a lot more uh, different kinds of work. So just, you know, my, my two cents for what it's worth. So around 2014, I started going back and looking for work at firms. And um, it was a little frightening. I wasn't sure if I had a portfolio that anybody would be interested in. I didn't have any um, office work, really, for quite a while, because I'd been working for myself for such a long time. Um, so there's this sort of thing that uh, I've talked about with my friends where you feel like you've got to find the on-ramp back onto the highway. You've been driving around the neighborhood, and it's been really nice in the neighborhood, but you want to get back on the highway. You can't just get on the highway. You kind of have to be strategic and focused on it until you can find that on-ramp. Um, the first job I got was at April Phillips, where I went and I worked as a project manager. And um, this is the other thing. Uh, your network is worth gold. I came into San Francisco one night to go to a lecture. And on the way back on the BART train, I ran into Ray Freeman and Linda Phillips, who I knew through teaching with Ray. And I told them that I was trying to get back into a regular full-time job. And Linda said, you should call April. She's looking for someone. And I called April, and I had a job within a week. I had been looking for quite a while before that conversation on the train. So um, shout out for networking. Uh, I worked for April for a while. Uh, the commute was rough. I was going from Berkeley to San Rafael. Uh, and then I ended up uh, moving over to Twilo Associates, which was five blocks away from my house. We'll look at some of their work in a few minutes. It, not only was it geographically desirable, um, they do amazing design work. And it was a really good place for me for a while. Um, and then I had the opportunity to become a principal at PlaceWorks. And I didn't feel I could say no to that. Um, I have stayed on good terms with all of these people. And they're a valuable part of my network now. And I am a valuable part of their network, too. Uh, so you can do what you need to do without burning bridges, I guess. I would say. So um, here's some of the work that we were doing at Twilo Associates. And uh, the principal there, uh, Stefan Twilo, is a very strong designer. That firm is set up with one lead designer, and that's Stefan and then three or four project managers, and then six or seven production staff, and a bookkeeper, and you know some support staff. Um, and we did some amazing work. We were also catching a wave 
and doing a lot of work in um, Silicon Valley. So this project, we're going to see a couple different phases of this project tonight. This, um, this project was a much larger project, but this is a good shot of it, uh, for the Bohannon Corporation. And they own a huge chunk of Menlo Park, city of Menlo Park. So uh, they were building a new building for tech office space. And the thing that's great about these projects is they want the landscapes to look really cutting edge and beautiful. And there's an aesthetic of sort of clean minimalism with design, with materials that have, you know, interesting organic surfaces. So what you're seeing in this picture is um, regular old colored concrete, but it's laid in a really interesting shape. And it's a little hard to see on this screen, but um, Stefan has this signature scoring pattern. You, can you see like all these little angular score joints in this plaza? So the way that we poured this was really interesting in a technical way. Um, we would have the truck come out and they would pour maybe this piece and this piece and this piece. And they would leave a void in between each of those pours. And then they'd come back with another pour after the first pour had cured, and then they would fill in all those gaps. So what that allows you to do is um, have what looks like a, an irregular, more organic pattern, but you still have control joints that are controlling your cracking. Um, we would still define where expansion joints were going to be and lay those out. We had to do that. Um, but it, the other thing that's sort of interesting about it, you can kind of see that the concrete is slightly different colors between these pores, because you're never going to get a perfect match. And we sort of liked that organic quality. Uh, it looked more in keeping with the uh, natural sort of clean lined, but um, not pristine materials in the rest of the garden. So these retaining walls are made out of Corten steel that we um, detailed and had fabricated in a shop. And then they would come and install them and do some site welding and grinding to put them in place. Uh, we have um, cut EPE benches that sit on top of that wall, sort of like a, a cap. And they just wrap around it. So here's a place where these slats of EPE bend down around the Corten. Um, and a lot, we did a lot of Corten steel work in these projects. There are little headers here that are made out of Corten. Um, and quite a bit of grade change. There's another one of these uh, Corten retaining walls with the wooden uh, benches on top of it over here. So those themes go throughout the project. We also mixed in materials from time to time. So there are these paver bands that come through and interrupt the colored concrete. So how do you take a minimalist form-based site plan and make it interesting? You vary the score joints. You vary the materials. You make everything as perfect as you possibly can. Everything was as perfect as we could possibly make it. This is a private sector project with a large budget where they were really invested in having it look beautiful and perfect when they were done. So um, this kind of design is not impossible to do on a public project, but it's much, much easier to do for a, a well-funded private client. Um, we also, we did a lot of projects, but I'm just going to show you a couple right now for the character of the design that we did at this firm. Um, this is a new civic center that's going to be built in Newark, California. And again, the forms are fairly simple. Um, we're using a lot of sort of oval curves in this one. Uh, the materials, this is a rendering. This isn't the finished project. Uh, Newark was building three new buildings a police station, and a library, and a city hall. And they had three different architects. And then the landscape architecture team had to tie everything together. And again, there's a, a decent budget on this one. We really got to interact with the architects. They curved the face of the building for us so that the landscape and the buildings would, would speak to each other and have sort of a seamless vocabulary of forms. Um, and you can see some of the same tools that I was talking about in the previous project. Uh, we've got bands of colored concrete and pavers breaking up this space. And those bands extend out into the planting areas to break it up even a little bit more. So there's sort of a, a perfect 
blend of simplicity and a little bit of eccentricity here. The, um, these aren't necessarily regular or symmetrical. It makes it more interesting uh, when you're on the ground to have some variation along those lines. So um, the kind of work that we do at PlaceWorks is more public. Uh, we just finished this project again on Lake Merritt. Lake Merritt is my favorite place to work. Um, this is Snow Park. Uh, we realigned the roadway again here for this intersection. And um, this park is great because it includes a lot of interesting pieces. Uh, we've got a playground here. Uh, we have a rain garden over here with a sculptural piece in it. And then as part of the road reconfiguration, we got to do this complete streets <coughs> multimodal piece over here. They, they gave the road a diet. Do you guys talk about road diets? <laughs> we, we throw that around on these projects a lot. So the idea is, your road is too fat. We're going we're gonna to take the road, and we're going to put it on a diet, and we're going to make it thin. I don't want to be like, I don't want to take that metaphor too far. But the idea is, if you shrink down the space allotted to cars, it slows traffic. Um, and it makes room for all these other wonderful things. So we have rain gardens in the medians. We have a two-way cycle track that wasn't there before that goes along the side of the road. Uh, quite a bit more planting here. And we were also able to put in a new uh, pedestrian walk. So what used to be a four or five lane two-way street has been shrunk down to a single lane in each direction uh, with room for all of these amenities. Uh, the city typically owns about 60 feet from one property line to the other property line. And the road floats around in that space. That's the right-of-way. Um, you can do anything you want within the right-of-way as long as you don't exceed that 60 feet. So you could have four or five lanes of traffic, or you could have just a few lanes of traffic with bike lanes and trees. Um, there's a real strong trend right now to do this kind of, I don't know, we call it multimodal because it's cars and bicycles and walkers. And now it's, you know, scooters and motorized skateboards. There's all kinds of um, users for these non-vehicular, non-car and bus uh, travelways. Uh, and so it might include cars, it might include walkers, it might include bikes, it might include stormwater, which we are increasingly have to, having to deal with, uh, and planting, right? So trees and vegetated buffers. Um, so this has been a really fun project uh, to be involved with. It just opened in June, and um, it was immediately taken over by wonderful Oakland residents who are so happy to have another park. So. That's been very gratifying. It was uh, 10 years of work for PlaceWorks to get this from start to finish. It was a very complicated project. Um, and I just sort of came in on the end of it and got to enjoy the good part. But um, I do think it's a pretty interesting representative sample of what a lot of the larger firms are doing for bread and butter right now. Cities are really, you know, I've, I mentioned at the beginning that some of our planning work is trying to reduce greenhouse gases, um, sustainability plans, and the main tool that cities have for doing that is managing transit, and providing more bicycle routes and safe routes, uh, making sure that things like schools have safe routes from neighborhoods to the schools. So we're doing a lot of street work right now. I'm going to shift gears for a minute and just talk a little bit about um, things that are interesting to me, that have always been interesting to me, that are still sort of um, you know, touchstones, things that maybe I can't do exactly the way they are uh, in these amazing projects, but we can take pieces of them. So I'm going to show you some earth art works that I love, and then I'm going to show you some projects that I've worked on where we've been able to do some of those things on a smaller scale. Um, so this, uh, you guys have probably seen some of these. Charles Jenks is a, a British designer who does amazing parks that are all about topography. Um, this is just one example. Uh, it's easier maybe in a climate where it rains all the time, 
because irrigating these things is very difficult, as I'll talk about in a minute in California. So I love his projects. Um, this is a this is a prehistoric site in Ohio. I think it's in. I meant to put the city down here. I'm not remembering exactly where it is. Um, nobody knows why this was built. Nobody knows exactly who built it, but clearly there is some very intentional landform. It's a very old landscape, pre-European landscape, uh, called the Serpent Mound. Um, this is what I'm saying about grading <laughs> being the most permanent thing you can do in the landscape. Who knows, maybe there were trees or shrubs or gardens or structures, but what's left all this time later is this beautiful sinuous form that they made with soil. Um, this is another, oh wow, these things really do not blow up well, I'm sorry. Um, this project is called Opus 40. This, this sculptor, Harvey Fite, worked on it by himself for 40 years uh, in an abandoned stone quarry. He just went out every day and moved rocks around, and he built this amazing multi-level art object that you can walk around. Um, I apologize for the quality of the slide, but there's a lot of information online. Uh, this is a very famous uh, earth art piece, and I encourage you to go and look at it if, if you're interested in this image. Um, what I love about these uh, is that it's almost like sculpture you can walk in. So he's got a like a, a 50s vocabulary of form, maybe, right? So in the United States, we talk about, uh, we make fun of it when we say kidney bean uh, design. So maybe the pool is shaped like a kidney bean or like a cashew. But um, when someone does it skillfully, I think it's still really beautiful. So these, these curving forms that aren't really circular, um, maybe circles appear from time to time. And it's three-dimensional. You can move around in it. You can walk in it. There are places where you can go down and it's up above your head. It's a very rich uh, spatial environment, um, which is what really interests me about these things. All right, so I haven't gotten to do this yet. Still crossing my fingers. We'll get a client that wants to do this. Um, but I have gotten to do quite a few projects that had three-dimensional design elements in them. Um, and I'm going to start with a really simple one, just because, you know, not everything is in uh, SketchUp. And this was before we had SketchUp and Lumion. I love Lumion, by the way. Um, it's expensive, so you might not get to play with that till you get to a, a firm that can afford it. But you, you have it? Oh, great. You should learn that stuff. <laughs> it's um, very marketable, job seekers, very marketable. But this one, um, I worked with these sculptors, Dobb and Furman, and they wanted to go after a park competition in Las Vegas, and they asked me to do the landscape design. And this was when I was still working out of my house, so this is my dining room table. Um, but I just started thinking about it three-dimensionally, with the simplest of materials, I like cut chunks of cardboard that were to scale. And um, this day I was feeling like thinking about trees. I put some tissue paper and some wine glasses. It just helped me visualize what could this be. And you can see this is really loose. I'm still drawing on tracing paper here. Um, here are some humans. It's really important to have some scale figures in your work when you're thinking three-dimensionally so that you can imagine what it would feel like to be there. So I worked on this and um, Rob Furman and I are still friends and we talked about it a lot and we ended up developing an idea that we felt strong enough to go to the competition with and we commissioned an acrylic model by a professional model maker. Um, this was six feet by four feet and um, it's simpler now, right? But um, we ended up with this sort of sculptural element that you could walk on, similar to Maya Lin's Vietnam Veterans Memorial. It would have names inscribed on black uh, granite around the outside perimeter. Uh, and then their main sculptural gesture was going to be this gilded eagle with a bell in the tower. I thought this was a great design, but we didn't win. But um, I still, it was really fun to work on. I really, really enjoyed working on this one. 
uh, I want to show you a Twilo project that is finished now. And this is a picture of this project under construction. And uh, I know we're getting close on time. I got to go a little faster. Uh, the idea here was to have a, a ring of raised earth with pathways that cut through it with pieces of metal forming those cut ends with a plaza inside, a small, like three or four person sized plaza. And um, this is what it looked like when they were working on it. And this is what it looked like when it was finished. It's quite beautiful when it's done. And you know, Twilo uh, trademark components here, maybe you see them by now. So here's, uh, actually this is decomposed granite with stabilizer cut through with a, a colored concrete path. And in this picture, you can see we had these custom pieces of metal made to make a clean, modern end to the earth form. So I think it's a, these are all Stefan's designs. It was his firm, but um, this was really fun. So we did construction drawings for the grades, and we drew lots of sections, and we, we had working drawings that directed all of this work, and it came out great. Uh, another Twilo project, sorry for the blurry slide, I had to pull this from the archives. Um, this is a water feature that is also a retaining element and it has basalt fins and the water is to flow down through these fins. Um, this did not end up getting built. Even after we designed the whole thing, I'm going to show you, um, we did quite a thick package of working drawings for this project, maybe 200 sheets for the landscape drawings. And um, we had many, many different kinds of details and plans describing this sculptural feature. Uh, here's a layout plan that's talking about materials, basalt stone wall, uh, concrete trough wall, basalt runnel, um, stone paving. And then, you know, while we're doing this, we still have to think about where is water going to go and how is it going to be irrigated and what plants will live in San Jose. We've got a strip drain here at the property line trying to make clean drainage that doesn't require a lot of warping in the pavements. Um, here's a section that we drew for this so we could prove that we were going to comply with ADA because all of this stuff had to go through city review. Here's the... Uh, grading plan for that part of the project. Um, contractors really only work from spot grades. So uh, we often end up drawing contour plans while we're thinking about something. And sometimes, for example, that donut plaza that I showed you earlier, we had some contour lines on the drawings for that just to show them what we were trying to do. But 90% of the time, you're going to have a series of these very technical spot grades describing what the levels are. Um, so here's that fountain feature with some stairs on either side. Um, so the, the thing that's continuing to be interesting to me about this is you come up with this sculptural idea and then you have to translate it into these assembly instructions. And I still find that process very interesting. At Placeworks, we just finished a park in San Jose uh, dedicated to a writer, Iris Chang. Um, the centerpiece of this park, uh, we had trouble getting the sod to establish. It looks fantastic now, but um, this one shows the grading. There's a, a sculptural piece in the middle, and the grass flows up to it in a series of ripples. And the idea here was one person makes a big difference. Um, so this is meant to be a stone striking a pool of water and making ripples that extend out forever into the world as influence. And we were able to persuade the city to let us do this as earth form, <laughs> which is fantastic. Um, very, very hard to irrigate this, um, but we made it through the hottest part of the summer, and once the rains come, I think we're going to be fine. We used no mow turf on this, obviously, because you're never going to get someone to mow this. It's not possible. Um, here's what that turf looked like on opening day. This is a different part of the park. But um, you know, these, these meadowy plant materials are really lovely on earth form. And they solve a lot of the maintenance problems that you might worry about with um, 
shrubs that might not get watered enough or regular turf that has to be mowed. Um, I'm just going to show you one more park project from PlaceWorks. Um, this is a park in Alameda. And um, this hill has a little plaza at the top with a play structure and then a climbing slope and a slide that's built onto the hill. This site was flat when we started. Um, we proposed to the city that we build this hill and it extends down in sort of a ridge uh, into a nature play area with stumps and logs and boulders. Um, and they were excited by the idea and um, it worked out great. This park opened a year or two ago and we're having trouble because people love it so much that they're wearing the grass down to nothing with foot traffic. But um, it's a very successful uh, design idea, I think, that was implemented in a difficult setting. You know, park budgets are not like uh, South Bay, Silicon Valley budgets, um, but the city was really excited about the idea and we were able to get it built. So I've got like two minutes left. Oh, wait, how, how, I'm going to go a little bit over if that's okay. It's not too much more. All right. Um, I wish someone had told me how offices work when I was a student, and maybe they did, and I wasn't interested because I was still thinking I wanted to be an artist of some kind, which you can do, but it's good to understand the business side too. So I'm going to just tell you a little bit about PlaceWorks. Um, there are three levels of people within larger firms. There's um, the drafters or the production staff, and they're doing all the production work, the AutoCAD, the Lumion graphics, the uh, InDesign and Illustrator Photoshop work. In a way, I mean, the drafters really get to do all the fun stuff sometimes, I think. It's stressful because you're always on a deadline, but you're, you're making the graphics and you're drawing um, the plans. Uh, you're turning the ideas into the deliverables that will go to clients. So these are people in like the first, you know, six or seven years of their career. Sometimes, depending on the firm, they, they want you to become a project manager faster. Um, project managers are more experienced and they're responsible for the work at the project level. So um, the project manager is the person who talks to the client every day. They're the person who yells at the contractor or says what a great job they did. They're sort of like the nerve center of each project. So the project manager is responsible for assigning work to the production staff. They also have to manage all the budgets and the schedules, so they don't get to do as much um, graphic work and drafting work because they're managing everything. This also becomes very interesting if you like thinking about how things get done and how things fit into the permitting environment, how budgets work. You get the most um, contact with clients and with civil engineers and architects and city staff. Um, project manager is sort of at the center of the project. The principals um, are sort of this higher level uh, activity in the firm. And they're not really doing very much with the projects in a lot of firms. At Stefan's firm, Stefan did all the design work because that's how he wanted to sail his boat. He had his firm set up to suit him and he loved doing the design work, so he did all the design work. But at many firms, the principals are really there to support the project managers. If there's a technical question, um, they help answer it. Uh, they review all of the drawings and make sure that the quality is good enough before they go out. They monitor the work of these uh, other people on the team, but they spend a lot of their time going out and finding work, really. Uh, I, spend, I spend half of my time uh, going out and trying to find work. Uh, half of my time I'm supposed to be billable, but I often don't manage to be billable for half of my time. There's a lot that needs to be done to win projects. Uh, and for the big public projects that we do at PlaceWorks, you don't just go and have lunch with someone and get the project. They issue a public notice that they're getting ready to award a contract, and then, you know, 20 firms want that job. And you all go and compete for it. At PlaceWorks, 
we put together a proposal like this for every job we try to win. It's like a book. Here's all our projects. Um, typically, there will be um, a whole section committed to our analysis of what the city needs and exactly what we could do for them. We spend weeks making a proposal for a job we might win or we might not win. Um, Project managers, again, you know, they're sort of like the nerve of the project, and so they're supposed to spend a lot more of their billable time doing that work. Um, but they also start having some responsibility for things that can't be billed, uh, looking for work, where they happen to be, doing some in administration. For people who are at entry level, you're pretty much expected to be billable all the time. So you're, you, you're like a a rower chained to a bench in a, in a ship. You're just, uh, just producing stuff all the time. And um, I liked that work a lot. Uh, people give you the work to do. You do it. They look at it and they redline it. They give it back to you. It's, it's very satisfying in some ways, just getting to handle a lot of stuff and produce a lot of material. So not every firm is like this, but this is sort of like the traditional way that a firm runs. And um, the people who are profitable in this pyramid are these people. <laughs> so you're going to have a lot of production staff, not very many project managers, and then typically only a couple of principals at the top. And then the whole firm is like an organized effort to get the work done and find more work. So at PlaceWorks, uh, <laughs> I, just, I just took some pictures. What does it look like? We're all very friendly and informal. Uh, one of the things that I love about PlaceWorks is that if you don't have a meeting, uh, you can kind of show up wearing whatever you want as long as it's you know, not ripped or uh, unprofessional looking. A lot of folks here are bicycle commuters. It's very healthy uh, work-life balance. Um, people work from home sometimes. Um, but we have an open plan office where our production staff uh, sits together and we've got a big magnetic wall that we can stick sketches to. Um, the uh, project managers tend to have their own offices because they're on the phone all the time talking to clients. Um, so this is Cynthia Greenberg. She's my, uh, my old friend and uh, now my project manager. Uh, Isby Fleischman is in here too. Um, Cynthia's been at PlaceWorks for 17 years, I think. So that's unusual. For a person who's jumped around from firm to firm a lot, I've ended up at a place where people are very happy and they don't tend to move on. Um, and then uh, here's my office. <laughs> I get my own room and my own phone, and I can shut the door and nobody will bug me if I need to do some phone calling. I really think of the principles as being in service to everybody else in the firm. It's not really like being the emperor where you get to sort of like wave your arms around and get whatever you want. If you want the firm to thrive, principals are constantly trying to feed project work and learning opportunities and uh, you know, things that make staff happy. We're just trying to take care of the office all the time in a good firm, right? Um, if you have happy staff, they don't quit and then you don't have to replace them. And then the whole firm just gets better and better and better over time. So I think it's really important for firms to invest in their staff and try and fit people to project types that they'd like to work on wherever that's possible. And I spend a lot of time thinking about that. So it's not really my little boat anymore. I'm in charge of a cruise ship and I'm trying to keep everybody happy. Okay, so this is my last slide. I just, I can't resist giving you guys a little bit of advice. You didn't ask for it. I'm going to give it to you anyways. <laughs> um, so how do you start? So I sort of feel like at the beginning it's easier to get experience in small firms. Um, you can go and get a job at a big firm and that is fantastic. For me, it was easier to jump around a lot. Um, and try a lot of different things before I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Also, I really, I, this curiosity thing, I'm just always trying to learn stuff that I didn't know before. And so it worked well for me to do that. But um, don't be limited by what you don't know yet. Life is long, and 
you probably have 20 or 30 or I don't know, depending on how old you are, you have a lot of time to be a landscape architect. Um, there's plenty of time to try different things. Uh, I don't know, that's my advice on that point. Um, I feel large teams and ambitious projects can also be extremely satisfying. When I was working for all those small companies, we never ever would have been able to do those big South Bay projects. That was a, you know, we had five or six people at Twilo working full time on those projects all the time to meet the deadlines. So we really needed a big organization to do that. Um, successful firms seek to hire people who come in with some talent and experience, but we're also looking for people who have similar values. Uh, I think when you're looking for your first job, maybe there's an anxiety and you feel like you just have to put it all into the portfolio. There are intangibles that go along with that. Um, are you the kind of person who's going to be a pleasure to work with every day? Are you teachable? You know, do you show up on time? Can you listen? Um, are you interested in learning new things? A lot of those intangibles, because I've been on both sides of that desk now. I've been a job seeker full of anxiety. I've also been on the interviewing side of the table and you know, trying to, the, the portfolios are usually all pretty good. So then how do you pick? If you've got three or four candidates that all have amazing portfolios, you're going to pick the person who looks like they're going to be a good fit for the firm and they're going to be able to grow with the firm and contribute to the health of the company, if that makes sense. So that's actually an easier thing to accomplish, you know. Um, be authentic. Talk about what you're excited about. Uh, let them know what you're looking for. And don't take it personally if you don't get hired because maybe it's not the right place. Um, I also think it's really important to think about what kinds of projects you want to work on. If you're going to be doing drafting eight hours a day all day long, which some firms might have you do, it should be something that you're interested in. You're going to learn a lot, even if you're just doing the drafting. Um, I also like to think about uh, seeking an office structure that suits you. Um, some folks will graduate from school and they'll run out and their, they'll start their own firms right away. Um, that's great. Some people will love that. Uh, I didn't want to do that because I like being on a team and I like working with people. Uh, I like learning from people that have more experience than I do. Um, so this is sort of like questions to ask yourself. Do you find large groups of people stimulating or overwhelming? Like what's the right size of office for you? There are design firms that have 70 people. When you go and work at an office like that, it'll take a long time before everybody knows your name. Maybe you'll find that liberating, or maybe you'll find it soul killing. I don't know. It, it has to do with what makes you happy and what the good fit is for you. Um, how much variety and how steep of a learning curve do you enjoy? Some firms do the same project over and over and over again, and you can get really, really good at doing that. And then you have a low stress, predictable, enjoyable day, if you like that kind of thing. Some firms, there's always something new coming in the door. The deadlines are coming really fast and hard, but you get to do so much work. Um, maybe that's the environment that you would enjoy being in. I almost feel like that kind of like what's what's the weather at this firm? You know what what's the pace? What kind of work is it? How do people relate to each other? If you can try and figure that out um, while you're interviewing or considering firms, that stuff's really important. Do you like to be given well-defined tasks with lots of support, or would you rather work really independently with minimal direction? Different firms will have very well-defined culture around this. In some firms, you are absolutely expected to stay in your lane. They tell you what to do, and you do it. And then the whole team runs really smoothly. Some firms, they kind of let everybody have a little piece and go, go away and solve it and then come back. And that structure can work really smoothly, too. The thing that you won't find is a firm that mixes those two together very often because it tends to frustrate everybody. So I would think a little bit about what kind of structure around you you'd like to have uh, in your office environment. Um, 
And then the last question I like to ask people is, you know, start thinking about your inner compass. You clearly have one already because you're here. Uh, where would you like to be in three years? Where would you like to be in 10 years? Um, the big one, uh, at the end of your career, what do you hope you will have accomplished? And I, I mean, I, I took all the time to walk you through, like, all of the twists and turns in my career and where I started. I did not expect to end up here. A lot of things can happen over a career of 20 or 30 years. There's no reason you can't be ambitious and think about the kinds of projects you want to be working on, you know, 10 years down the line because the decisions that you make between now and then can get you there as long as you know what you're trying to do. So um, my parting advice is think big and don't worry about what you don't know. Um, just find stuff that you enjoy doing and go for it. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, do you guys have any questions off the top of your head? Yeah. yeah. After listening to your presentation, uh, it feels like you have a lot of experience with drafting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to ask what, um, when you start uh, drawing for designing a plan, drafting a plan, what would you think first? And uh, what's oh, after uh -huh. that? Uh, what's your idea after um, the first step? Uh-huh. Um, let, me, let me see if this answers your question. So something that I didn't know when I started that I rely on every day now is um, what degree of tightness you need to aim for at every stage of the process. So at early stages of the project, when you're in schematic design, you want to be as loose as possible and almost like unconscious. Like sometimes I just, you know, draw things without thinking about it too much and just try and draw a lot of things and then go back and look at it and see what's going on within that drawing. Um, as you proceed, your drawings get tighter and tighter and you need to be more and more detailed about exactly where that line is or exactly what shape that thing is. Um, what was hard for me when I was starting was that I was anxious and I thought that during schematic design I had to be able to draw a perfect hard-lined concept without going through the, wa the wasted time, right, <laughs> of sketching and iterating. Um, I think it's more efficient to just do a lot, a lot of versions, draw it, redraw it, redraw it, think about a little thing you can change. It's almost like letting the design show itself to you. Um, I think the looser you can stay and the, the more you can turn your judgment off when you're drawing in early stages, the easier it is. Is, is that sort of what you were asking yeah. about? Yeah, that's, okay. that's what I needed. Oh, good. <laughs> How did you find balance when your children were young? Well, you know, I, uh, I kind of, I, I, uh, that was where I really felt I had to start my own firm and be a little more flexible and a little more part-time. And sometimes in order to get the work done, that meant that I was working odd hours. So I might work on the weekends or work on the evenings. Um, my children were in daycare that was really close to the house. They also, um, uh, got used to seeing me working. <laughs> uh, but I could, I could do it at a pace and at a rhythm that fit what needed to happen in the household. Um, for whatever reason, you know, uh, I think a lot of women feel like they really need to be the one who's available all the time. And it's, it's just harder to structure uh, project work around that, that highest goal of being sure that you're there for your family. So that was how I solved it. I knew um, several other people that ended up doing the same thing. Um, nothing is permanent. Uh, I can't remember, was it, somebody said, you, it might have been Ruth Bader Ginsburg, maybe somebody else, you can have it all, but you just can't have it all at the same time. So there was a, there was a 10 year period there where um, I had to put a lot of things on hold. And it was, um, a little scary to put those things on hold, but they did come back to me. And um, I'm very happy about uh, how my sons have turned out because they had really good support during that time. So those are my thoughts on that. 
It's much easier now because you can work remotely, you can work from home. Um, there's no reason that you can't um, decide how you want your working hours to function and then seek out that kind of arrangement. It might take some time to find it, but yeah. Do you have any tips for visualizing earth form from 2D to 3D? Hmm. You know, um, when I'm looking at a topo map or a contour drawing, I, I often think about it as like something sticking up out of a, a lake or a bathtub. And those lines, those contour lines are like different levels of water that could occur around that earth form. That was the most useful way for me to think about it, um, as if the high points in your drawing are like islands sticking up out of space, and the low points are like basins. I think about a lot of these things in terms of water. Um, but that's something that gets much easier over time. The more you practice looking at uh, grading drawings and contour maps, the more intuitive it becomes. So. Sometimes you just have to practice. Is it, possible, is it possible to paint the concrete using natural stainers? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, I am going to uh, refer you to iron oxide dust, which um, makes a beautiful golden stain on concrete. Concrete's kind of porous. Um, it's not really a paint but it's basically just iron dust and you can definitely use that in a lot of situations. There are a number of different surface treatments um, through Davis and through Schofield and they, they often tend to have some kind of mineral component, copper or iron that gives it the color, but I wouldn't call those natural. They're gonna have emulsifiers and binders and sealers and things in them. So um, iron, iron dust is the way to go. Iron oxide. So this is a question from Russia. Um, how old can you start training? Is it okay to start between 30 to 40, if you're like 30 to 40 years old? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I was a little bit of a late bloomer because I fiddled around with all these other things first. Um, I know people who began in their 40s as a second career. Uh, and during my teaching, I've had a lot of people who were just burned out in tech and um, they're transitioning into landscape design because they thought it would be more satisfying. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that there's any limit on the age that you start. Uh, even in the first four or five years of your career, you can be useful to a firm if you have drafting skills or hand skills. Sometimes older people um, have some soft skills that younger people haven't acquired yet. So maybe you're really good with uh, people and you know how to communicate and you're confident in talking to clients. Uh, or maybe there are some skills from your past work that transfer in some way. The way my desktop publishing skills became so useful to me when I came into landscape architecture. Um, if you want to do it, I think it's worth a try. So what could catch your attention if you're looking at portfolios? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, at our office, you really need to have something that translates into profitability. So that is AutoCAD or um, Photoshop or Illustrator or SketchUp. And then, you know, a, a, a good basic <laughs> ability to handle colors and forms. Um, it's nice to see some variety, like different kinds of work uh, in the portfolio. Um, I like to see whether someone can write. You know, if, if, I, if I look at a portfolio that's got written stuff and it's not um, well proofread, I, you know, I mean, there's, there's so many things that need to happen in the office, and someone who's got a really good skill set, we, we know we can try just throwing things at them and see if they can do it, and it makes you a more valuable team member right off, off the get-go. I think it depends from firm to firm, too. So 
Placeworks, you know, we're not really a, a high design firm. We do a lot more of this public outreach stuff. So we're doing a lot of um, presentation graphics, posters for public meetings. Um, do you have the basic skills to do layout and set up a poster? That's something that we look for all the time. Um, I know there are some firms who really want to see amazing photo simulation and visionary ideas in the portfolio, but there might be fewer of those than we fear as job seekers. <laughs> My question is, if I want to earn lots of money, so which one, which level should I um, try to become, like the principal, the manager, or the drafter? If you want to go into planning? No, to earn money. Oh. <laughs> You gotta be a principal. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, my unscientific experience is that uh, entry level production folks are making sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year. Uh, project managers are making eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year, and principals are like in the six digits. But you know, it varies a ton. I mean, I almost hate to throw numbers out because your mileage may vary. A f like Placeworks, um, because it's a planning firm, pays better than most landscape architecture firms. Planners are more profitable than landscape architects. I don't know why. Um, I don't know why. Uh, so there will be some firms out there that, you know, pay lower and some that pay higher. Every firm has to balance what they're able to bill from their clients against what they pay their staff. So again, it's not personal. It's usually a very simple equation. Uh, if we pay you X, we need to bring in Y amount of dollars. And so if you work at a firm where they're willing to explain how the, how the business is set up, it's very interesting. And then you understand how the amount of work that you can do contributes to the profit that the firm makes, which turns into your pay. It's <laughs> so the more useful you are, the more money you make. And the more you can handle complicated things like client interactions and contracts and bringing in work, the more valuable you become. And it takes time to get those things. Yeah. How valuable can an MBA holder have coming fresh into this industry? Hmm. I don't know. I think some firms would be very interested in that. Um, for some firms, it may not be an asset. Um, an MBA who doesn't know anything about construction is not profitable. I mean, that's a simple way to look at it, right? So the, the bread and butter of a design firm is designing and managing or observing the construction to get something done on schedule and on budget. So there's a lot of discipline-specific stuff you need to know before you can manage everybody in the firm to make a profitable firm. I think it's useful. I, you know, I, I feel like a lot of designers, including myself when I was younger, would really benefit from thinking a little bit more about how the business works and how our creative efforts turn into income. Because um, it's, you know, it's, it's all logical. <laughs> it's explainable, um, but usually people don't bother trying to explain it to you until you've been at the firm for a while. What is the international demand slash scope for landscape architects? If I would like to travel, are there opportunities worldwide? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm just trying to think. I know um, it's a little out of date now, but during the recession, because business was so bad here in the Bay Area, I knew a lot of people that went and worked on projects in China. A ton of people from the Bay Area um, were at firms that ended up getting work uh, in Asia. And um, I think there's still a pretty strong flow back and forth between Asia and the West Coast. Um, I think it's a little bit harder uh, to transition over to European countries. They have slightly different, ironically, right, because there's maybe more of a, um, an English presence there, cultural overlap. But um, 
yeah. So, so I, I would say specifically uh, within Asia, there's a ton of opportunity for that. Thank you so much for coming. Um, your story was great. Oh, uh, good. It was really good to hear about. I think it's really interesting, the connections between art uh, and landforms and landscape architecture, and you have a, just such a breadth of um, experience, and your ability to communicate that is really great. So um, just want to thank you. Thanks for having um, me.